Intel source code is leaked, I've got news from Black Hat and DEF CON, and the NSA warns of location data exposure. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for August 11, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. A big announcement that I have been waiting for. When I hit my next goal on Patreon, I will be signing up for their merchandise tool that I just got access to, which means that you will get reoccurring merchandise and swag added to existing tiers, and a new merch tier will be added as well. Patreon will take care of shipping worldwide automatically which means that you will get physical rewards like t-shirts, hoodies, I really want a hoodie for the winter months here in Colorado, I'm so excited about that, coffee mugs, stickers, and a whole lot more, much faster too, which is great. The link is down below to sign up, and I will make an announcement when that goal is reached. We're about 84% of the way there, so we're super close. I'm so excited about unlocking swag rewards. But until then, on to the news. A now suspended Twitter user and Swiss software engineer named Tilly Kotman posted some vague information on Twitter last week regarding their leak of about 20 gigs of data from Intel that was provided by a source. This included proprietary data and source code that was originally only available to partners via an NDA from the CPU manufacturer. The data was posted via an online file sharing site, and Kotman said that there would be other leaks in the future. According to a spokesperson for Intel, the data did not include any personal or customer information. Now, Kotman runs a Telegram channel where they publish leaks on a regular basis through misconfigured servers, or repos, and web portals. It appears that this leak of data was given to them from an anonymous source. Now, while Kotman says that the data came from a data breach earlier this year via an unsecured Akamai CDN hosted server, the company said that the data appears to come from their Intel Resource and Design Center, which hosts information for partners with registered access, and they don't believe that it actually came from a data breach. They think someone who had access to the center downloaded and shared the data. Now, it is perfectly normal for major tech manufacturers to have NDAs with partners so other companies can build upon these platforms. Smartphone manufacturers, for example, do this with phone case companies so that third-party cases will be available for new phones right when they release. Chipset manufacturers are no different. The leak of data has been dubbed X Confidential Lake, which is a play on Intel's chip nicknames, and Ars Technica reviewed the data and found that it consisted of design specs for boards, source code, test documentation and presentations, dating back from Q4 of 2018 all the way up to May of 2020. Now, while the data did not contain any personal information for customers or associates, if what Kotman says is true, that there are further leaks that could change in the future. Intel is currently investigating. Tis time for my annual DEF CON and Black Hat News Roundup. Every year I scour the news to find the most interesting talks and announcements from these two events, and while this year was virtual, I am still providing that news. If you saw others that you think I should know about, please share them with me, and I would love to amplify the folks that are putting in the work to build a safer internet. Now let's go ahead and start with satellite hacking. Academic researcher and doctoral candidate at Oxford, James Paver, spoke at Black Hat 2020 as well as DEF CON about the ability for attackers to eavesdrop on signals from pretty much anywhere on the globe with $300 of readily available equipment aimed at satellites. Remote camps, planes, and ships at sea use satellite ISPs for connectivity. Users connect with a satellite and the satellite beams the signal back down to a hub, which is is then routed to the internet. Traffic sent downlink is broadcast with many other customers, and Paver discovered that data is sent in a wide beam format. That data could hit not only the ISP satellite, but also an attacker's dish listening in from some other location. Using a satellite dish like the ones used for a TV, for example, that you would see on the side of a person's household, a PCIe satellite tuner card, and software called EPS Pro, which helps customers figure out where to point their 
TV receiver dishes. Then looking for artifacts in a radio spectrum, he was able to find different feeds. An attacker could record and analyze those feeds to determine if they're actually from a TV channel or they are actually internet traffic, and whether it's sent in a format easily parsed by Wireshark or using the newer protocol which is called Generic Stream Encapsulation, or GSE for short. Enterprise users tend to use GSE, so Paver's team wrote a tool called GC Extract to reconstruct any corrupted GSE data. Paver's team was able to see communications from wind turbines, between a lawyer and their client, ship information and fishing boats, a subsea repair ship, cargo vessels, and a billionaire's yacht, all transmitting and many of which were transmitting data in clear text. Their findings have been responsibly disclosed to the tested individuals that they found, and the FBI even released an advisory about VSAT signals. Now, we got some good news during Black Hat this year as well. While voting machine hacking villages have been around at HackerCons for at least the last several years, it took this long, actually this long, for one of the major manufacturers to finally get on board with security researchers by implementing a vulnerability disclosure policy and program. Election Systems and Software, which is ESNS for short, announced their new policy on Wednesday, releasing a PDF online about their program, which covers all digital assets, including IT networks and public-facing websites run by the company. Now, while their policy does not cover testing of state and local government election-related networks or assets, ESNS stated for anything not owned by their company, they will still accept reports as a result of research under under their new policy. This news will allow security researchers to find vulnerabilities without the overwhelming threat of legal action from ESNS, and it waives restrictions with regards to any work done under that policy. Now, back in 2018, ESNS criticized DEF CON attendees for trying to test their voting machines against any kind of hacks. So this is a complete turnaround from their previous opinions of security researchers. In 2019, a total of 35 systems were found to be connected to the internet and several voting machines seen at these conventions have had vulnerabilities. With this news, hopefully we will see more election system companies building their own policies and programs to swiftly handle election security. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com slash Threatwire. Check out these amazing new fur babies from my Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons. They are totally awesome for sending them in. I always love them. Thank you so much for sending them over to me. Also, a new perk has been added. As a new subscriber, as well as a current subscriber, you will get access to action alerts. In fact, I just posted like three or four of them over the weekend. Anytime a new vulnerability is announced or a new breach has occurred, I will share details on Patreon so you can update, patch, or find those flaws ASAP. This is alongside the current goal of an audio podcast. There's also so much to cover in security and privacy. I never have time to discuss everything in these episodes. So if you want to see me cover more InfoSec news as an audio podcast or even a second episode of ThreatWire each week, make sure to check out Patreon down below in the links. I have tons of goals. You can see how you can make that happen. Thank you so much to my current supporters. This top story was chosen by the Threatwire patrons over on Patreon. The NSA has put out an advisory last Tuesday for government workers and basically anyone who wants to audit their personal security about disabling or turning off location-based data on mobile phones, including the Find My Phone feature, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and using airplane mode when phones are not in use. The agency explains that while much of these features are considered indispensable to users, it's also extremely valuable and should be protected in specific scenarios as it could expose location information. They recommend users should consider their specific situation and risk tolerance whenever using location services. Now, the NSA went on to explain that location tracking could be detrimental to missions, and the advisory is attended primarily for DOD 
and NSS system users, but much of their advisory is already common knowledge in the security and privacy community, such as mobile devices inherently trusting cellular networks and automatically connecting to towers, for example. Now, providers receive real-time location data that can be used for emergency response, but may also create location-based risks. Rogue base stations exist, and cell providers have also been known to sell data to third parties for profit. The NSA continued in their advisory saying GPS data is not the same as location services on a phone, and that disabling location services does not disable GPS, nor does it prevent a mobile OS from using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to determine location. Apps can also share location data if not set up correctly, and this can also go for IoT devices or smartwatches or medical devices and connected vehicles and a lot more. Their full mitigation process includes disabling location services, disabling radios like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, ensuring radios are turned off whenever you are in airplane mode, and auditing application settings to ensure that you aren't sharing location data while, for example, posting on social media. They also recommend users disable advertising permissions, avoid using apps that are related to locations such as shopping apps or fitness tracking trackers, turning off Find My Phone, minimizing web browsing, using a VPN, a good VPN, and minimizing location data that is stored in the cloud. For mission critical users where location data must not be revealed at all costs, the NSA recommends securing wireless capabilities in a non-sensitive location before missions start and ensuring that locations won't give away mission data, leave devices at non-sensitive locations, and use vehicles that are not connected. Now again, this is not new information, but it serves as a good reminder that phones track users. And that convenience of those little devices also comes at a cost of data privacy. Before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Hi Alex, Hi Alex, Jerome, Matthew, Chris, Dennis, Keith, Unseen Oni, and Groban DG who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you to each and every one of you. You are so awesome for joining. I appreciate you so much. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.